Hi creatives and welcome back to Agency Academy. My name is Marlin and here on the channel we talk about how to build a business that truly works for you so you have more freedom to create and do the things that you love. Today I thought I would share a little bit about how to basically like upgrade your logo research phase and to make sure that you get a lot more done in a faster amount of time and that you're adding a lot more value to your clients with a logo that is going to last for a long time. It's gonna be versatile and flexible and that can just work a little bit harder for the company that you're working with. And I want to give a little glimpse of a background in case you haven't seen us before uh, into my own background, which is just that before I became a designer, I was basically studying to be a researcher. So research and sort of background and gathering information for logo design has always been one of my favorite parts. Um, I think the easiest way to think about it, because most people only uh, do sort of visual research, so maybe some sort of creating mood boards or maybe you really like doing stylescapes. Uh, and they sort of tend to do that as the core part of their logo research, which is really important. But I think there are two things that you need to focus on when you're creating a logo research sort of stage or background before you start designing. The very first thing I like to do before I start any research is to talk to my clients about everything that they know and trying to verify that. So if the client has been around, if the company has been around for a bit, they probably have a little bit of knowledge about their customers, what they like, what they don't like. And uh, even if they're completely new, they might have an idea of who they're going to be selling to and why. So I think that's really important that we include our client in this process from the beginning because they probably have a ton of information that you can use. And it'll save you a lot of time as well. What we do have to do, though, is make sure that this information is, is accurate. So if you're asking your client different questions and you're talking about the persona and you're developing, let's say, their persona, then you can make sure to ask, oh, okay, great, so how do you know this? Are you looking at your analytics? Are you looking at, let's say, your customer base? Or is this feedback that you got when you asked people? Just making sure that it's not like a feeling, but it's a verifiable fact basically. Then when you're going into research, you can have this with you. So if you know that, for example, their clients really like the customer experience, but they're feeling a little bit unsure about how the logo is used in different applications, like maybe they don't recognize them on social media as much as they do on their website. And uh, that's something that you can have a look at and see how other brands are doing it. Once you know a little bit more about what your client already knows, you want to make sure that you're starting with some how might we questions or basically setting goals for the project. What does it look like if your logo is successful? What goals are we trying to reach with this logo? And that will help you be able to look for answers of how other companies have successfully done it so that you can find ways to incorporate it in a nice way to solve their problems. And so this might be things like, how might we make the logo easier to use, let's say on social media and on our website? How might we make the logo more interesting or memorable? Or how might we make the logo connect better with our customers? And so you're basically trying to say, this is what we're trying to achieve. And especially if you're doing a rebrand, I feel like this is super useful because when you're presenting the logo to your client, you can always refer back and say, hey, we wanted to make sure that this logo is a little bit better at different formats, for example. And here, look at the icon that I designed for social media. Look at the stacked version that I made for this purpose, for example. So it's easy for you to, rather than it being like opinion based when you're presenting work, you can always refer back to the research and that's a way for you to tie it together and help show your client the value they're bringing. The first one is the visual aspect. And so here we're basically talking about anything that is going to be related to trends, creating a mood board, looking at competitors' visuals, anything where you're trying to learn more about what the typical visual is in the industry, and also trying to understand like what the specific target audience that your customers have is going to like. So what I like to do for this is to try to look for focused and unfocused inspiration time. So during focused inspiration time, I like to specifically look at 
logo designs of competitors, logo designs of other brands that have the same target audience, maybe looking at things like Pinterest, Dribbble, uh, design inspiration, design books, all kinds of stuff. Like I really like this series, for example, which is by Counterprint. Uh, there's called like design from and they have different areas so like this one's from Latin America they have from all kinds of regions and there's just always so much interesting stuff that you can pick up specifically because they are like from different regions I think there's so much more like interesting inspiration and it's usually very situational which I think is super helpful as well because as you're designing a logo, you want to make sure you know how it's going to work in all kinds of aspects, not just like a standalone logo. So this is the focused research time uh, and sort of inspiration time. And so when you're creating mood boards and stuff, you can put things that you're finding into a folder that you can save and then pick up and use later. Um, the unfocused time is basically not thinking at all about logo or sometimes even branding, but looking to other creative fields or maybe you're watching like a movie uh, that will be really inspiring or going to an art museum, going to read more about uh, the, maybe the customers or let's say it's a sports brand. Maybe you're watching like different sport events and trying to see kind of inspiration from the field in general. And this is mostly so that you're not being too... Um, structured or linear in your thinking because sometimes you know we can get very stuck on a specific track like um, okay I'm making a logo for a beauty brand they typically look like this so I'm going to do something that feels similar which is good we need to know what the industry looks like but then we want to make sure we're not feeling too derivative of existing brands so that's why you really want to get that like inspiration from lots of different directions so that it can all meld together in your brain and you can create that unique piece of design in the end. So that's the visual research portion. And that typically finishes in some sort of mood board or stylescape. And the difference here is mainly that mood boards tend to be a little bit more general or I've even used mood boards for, to show different aspects of a brand, like one mood board to show how color is used and applied in the brand, and one mood board to look at, let's say, different logo designs, or maybe different mood boards to show slightly different feelings or vibes of a brand. Uh, stylescapes tend to be almost like one step towards a concept. So if you're seeing one, I'll put some up on the screen, like, for example, they might have uh, lots of things where you've altered the color tone, to be uniform across the stylescape, versus in a mood board, you might show different tech logos that are all kinds of different colors, for example. So that's like a way to differentiate between mood board and stylescape. I personally don't think that there is one better way to do it. Um, in my experience, mood boards take a little bit less time to create than stylescapes because with stylescapes, you have to go in and like alter or put things on mockups and make sure that it's super consistent to give that one emotion or feeling. But at the same time, stylescapes I find are easier to use once you get to concept scene stage because you have this like super sharp direction uh, for where the brand and the logo design is going. So that can also be really helpful to take into consideration. So now we're getting onto the bit that I am super excited about, which I think most people Maybe start a little bit, but um, I think there's so much more that you can do. And that's basically the psychology aspect of logo research. And this is kind of going a little bit into the market research and business strategy portion. So you'll have to see how you're deciding to charge for it. Um, sometimes we have seen a lot of creatives who charge separately for this service. And some people choose to do it as part of their logo design process, just because it means that the design result is going to be a lot more effective. So that's how we've decided to do it. We basically like bake it into the creative project and the brief in the beginning. And so here we want to find out everything that is going to be helpful in terms of informing the design style. So most of it is trying to define the persona first and then learning lots of things about them through different statistics, different reports and different information about other brands. So I'll tell you a little story that I think is going to be helpful for this kind of research and getting your head around what I mean by everything. So um, we worked with a brand that was helping millennials try to get a really good hold on their finances, plan for the future, really far away things like 
saving for pension or, for example, planning out for a mortgage or even getting rid of student debt and daily, like day-to-day budgeting. Uh, What we wanted to do was understand what feelings that we needed to create with the brand and with the logo. So we started by looking at the millennial mindset around money. And we realized that actually a lot of millennials have a very fear-based mindset around money because we've gone through a lot of these recessions and sort of catastrophes around money where a lot of our either family or people in our uh, surrounding have maybe lost their homes. Lots of people in our surrounding have really big student debts. And so there's a lot of this sort of hopelessness or fear-based uh, thinking around money. Uh, but then the things that were driving people were things like hoping that they could go on a nice holiday, have a house that could be their own one day, paying off their student debt and having that freedom that comes to it. Uh, So what we wanted to do from this research, we were able to conclude that the brand needed to feel calm, focused on what you can achieve by having your finances together. Uh, So rather than talking specifically about very nitty gritty things, we wanted to talk more about aspiration and positivity and uh, how it can be like self-care to take care of your finances. So that sort of started leading our research and our visual research more into self-care brands and brands that millennials like already. And so when I do this, I tend to look at a couple of different things. The first one I look at is statistical reports. And this sounds very intimidating, but it really doesn't have to be. So there's a ton of reports if you search for a subject like millennial attitudes to money or Uh, If you search search for like beauty habits of a specific age group or something like that, there's a ton of people who have already made really, really good data-based reports that have graphs and summaries and lots of helpful information that you can use. How like deep you decide to go into this information really depends on like the project budget, how much information there is. Sometimes some topics are super easy to find lots of information and some you really have to dig a little bit more. Depends on how many other companies are already in the space. Um, There's usually a lot of information that is already free from the government. There's also a lot of sites like Statista where some information is free and some of it can be purchased. So they typically do like industry reports where you can learn a lot about specifically, let's say if you're in the drinks industry or you're in the food industry or the healthcare industry. So there will be like specific reports created for certain years. So some of them do like every year they do a report about what's happening in the industry. And that can be really good to see what other brands that can be competitors, for example, have learned about the industry and are changing. Um, there's also, uh, if, let's say if you live in the UK, there's things like Business Gateway, and they actually do a lot of free reports that you can just go to the website, I'll put a link in the, in the, in the description, where you can go there and you can grab free industry reports. And even if you're not in the UK, sometimes you can learn things from other countries and markets as well. So it might be worth having a look at. Another thing I like to have a look at is Um, looking at competitors in the space and look at rebrands that they've done recently. So let's say you're noticing that all of the brands recently have switched from a really, um, let's say, elaborate looking logo to a super simple one. Then they have probably done their own research and realized that this is going to work better. So if you want to go even deeper, you can follow that up with looking at testimonials and reviews on the product and uh, look at how that company has evolved over time. So if you're noticing that lots of them are rebranding in a certain direction, that can also be a good indication of what the market is looking for. So once you've done all of this psychology research, uh, it's time to kind of create some sort of deliverable from this. And you could do it two ways, or I'm sure lots of ways, but the ways I've done it is two different ways. So the first one is to create a much more fleshed out or detailed persona. So you can put in a lot more about the psychology that we talked about before. So let's say you know that it's really important for people to have a brand that feels inclusive or a brand that feels very calm or very exciting. Or maybe you've seen that other brands are rebranding towards a more calm and simple style. All of that can go in the more detailed persona. And so that's one way to deliver this information to your client. Another way to do it is 
to create more of a little research report. And that's something that we always do on bigger projects. Basically, you can grab if there's a really helpful graph that you feel like, oh, this is exactly capturing that question that my client had. Then you can make sure to include that, write a little bit about how that impacts them, because we don't want to just put information. We want to make sure that we're actually tying it together with their brand and what that means for them specifically. And the research report is a great way for you, and even if you're presenting the persona, to tie back to those how might we questions. We want to tie it together with what the goal of the logo is so that we're saying, hey, we looked into all of these questions that you had. We looked at your uh, different customers that you want to reach. We looked at competitors. We looked at trends. We looked at visuals. And we're now seeing how to answer these questions. And here is the answer on a platter. <laughs> and so if you've done all of this before you even start designing, it will be a lot faster to design. It will be a lot easier to come up with ideas that your client will say yes to because it's almost pre-qualified in a way. And if you add together the psychology and the mood board or cellscapes, you have a lot to go on already. So that will, of course, require time and you need to charge for that as a service, but it will make the rest of the process a lot easier. Since we started this, we've had a lot fewer iterations. We've had a lot fewer sort of back and forth and changes, and we've had a lot more like trust in general with our clients, which is always the goal, because then people come back to you, they trust you, they know that the process is right, which means that the result is going to be right. So they're a lot more likely to refer you and to enjoy the work in the process. I'm always looking to add things to my like research portfolio or adding things that uh, I can do to make an even better job with the research. So if you have something like a place where you always look for information or a tip, like maybe, for example, you'll be running um, surveys. So that's something we've been doing as well sometimes. That's like a bonus tip, I guess. Uh, if you want to get information specifically from their customers, maybe you're uh, doing it to potential customers. Uh, let me know in the comments what it is that you do to make sure you're getting enough information to create that really effective logo for your clients. I hope this was helpful. If you liked the video, make sure to uh, like it, give us a subscription and hit that notification bell so that you get notified when we publish a new video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Good luck with your projects.